everybody. We've been talking about grip levels out there and track seal and influencing lap times. Well, now we've got something that really influences lap times. It is wet, heavy wet at Mount Panorama. That's going to change the game. 14 degrees out there at the moment, a 5 to 10 kilometre an hour breeze from the northwest. It will change everything. So we're going to have a 60 minute practice session for practice number four and it will be Scissors, paper, rock as to who gets in the car in these conditions because it is heavy wet out there. There are puddles forming. We saw the Toyota 86s out there just a moment ago and they were battling to maintain control in places because of the rivers that are running across the racetrack. We've been talking about it in the lead-up to this weekend being a factor and it has now well and truly arrived. So it's not that cold out there at the moment and the breeze is still pretty gentle but it is going to be a real challenge for drivers to be able to just feel their way around this racetrack and understand what the grip levels are like and not make a mistake. You cannot afford a mistake just prior to qualifying. With thanks to Pizza Hut, let's have a look at our racetrack. All 6.2 kilometres of this gorgeous racetrack and we're going to celebrate it in fine, bright style from last year's top 10 shootout lap for Chas Mostert as he makes the run down here towards turn one. Now the characteristics of this racetrack, big, open, fast and flowing, not particularly hard work for brakes or for bumps or indeed even for tyres. What it does have is amazing pace around here, so mountain straight ultimately reaching somewhere between 250 to 260 kilometres an hour before this dramatic uphill right-hander at turn two where you've got to plant the right corner of the car well and truly in the gutter then it's second to third briefly to fourth in some cases rather than dragging on the limit a turn three blind approach into the cutting back to one of the two slowest corners on the racetrack second gear 80 kilometers an hour and then holding second to third across the top of the little bump there in the back of the car skips sideways building speed up towards Sullivan Park grabbing fourth gear now plummeting down towards metal grade all hovering around 200 kilometers an hour grease it up to the concrete wall on the right little fan of the throttle back to 100% throttle in McPhillamy. Now sizing everything up, the whole universe to the east, over the top of Skyline. Third gear, second gear, trailing the brake all the way down to the dipper, up on two wheels, second gear out the other side, in the gutter, third gear, plunging down the hill again to about 180, 185 odd kilometres an hour. Back to second gear, watch out for the inside front locking at the left-hander, at the elbow. Don't clout the concrete wall on exit. Now relax the grip ever so slightly. Third, fourth, fifth and ultimately into sixth gear. More than 80 metres a second, the velocity of the cars, 300 kilometres an hour for one of the fastest corners in global motorsport through the fast right-hander at the bottom of the chase. 850 degree front brake temperature. Everything you can muster to press on that brake pedal. More than 100 kilos of leg load. And then popping out the other side in the direction change for another gigantic hit of the brakes at the bottom of the hill. Turn 23, the final corner at Murray's. Left-hander, second gear, out the other side. And that was good enough for an armor all pole. That was fun, Mark Skate. Are you okay? Just. You do love that lap, I love you? it. You love that lap. It was the fastest lap of all time, and that was a great call. Well done. It won't be quite that fast now with no. that stuff coming down. Here's reality. <laughs> Welcome back to it. And it is wet out there, so it's a great racetrack. It's one of the greatest racetracks in the world, but it is wet out there at the moment. And it demands just as much respect and just as much command of your motor car as what you saw Chas Mostert doing just a moment ago. Let's get to Mark Larkham. And what a shame, Cropper, you didn't talk to yourself like that back in the day when you were driving, mate. You would have been a ripper. Now, listen, we're going to go out into this wet session. So the question is, what are the things you can do to change your car? What are they going to be do to make these cars first wet in the... Uh, sorry, fast in the wet? First thing, they're going to put on wet tyres. Now, yellow markings on the side, that's about as hard as our hard tyre that we're using. So it's not going to wear away quickly, but it's all about pumping the water out through these grooves. That's the critical part of the wet tyre for us. Then we look at our race car. If we start right up at the front here, I'll duck around here. You can blank off some of these blankers because the engine, the radio, it's all not going to get as hot as it usually does. So the bit of blanking around the front, blank off your brakes. You're not going to be working the brakes as hot. The more you can blank off the front, the more downforce you get on the front of the car. Now, when we talk about downforce, you might change what we call the rake of the car, how it points into the wind. If you can get a little bit nose down and bum up, that under tray, under the front, 
will have a little more angle on it. The rear wing will have a little more angle on it. You'll have a little more downforce. Come down into here. You're going to change some of your geometry on the car. Anti-dive, anti-squat, roll centres, all these complicated issues. Anti-roll bars. So the car can move around a little bit more because the wet means the tyre doesn't have as much grip. So the car doesn't need as much resistance in it to fight the level of grip. You've got to let it move around and transfer some weight onto the tyre. When you accelerate, you've got to let out transfer weight onto the rear tyre. So, shock absorbers. We've got our Australian-made Petters by Supershock. Brilliant shock absorber in here. A little bit of tuning on that. You're going to change your springs. Let's come back here and have a look at those. Down in the rear, I showed you a little earlier. You're going to put a softer spring, probably in the front and the rear of the car. The car's not going to have as much grip, so you're not going to have the level of camber on your wheels. You want to stand those up a little bit. Come up here to the rear wing. You're going to put, that's adjustable, that rear wing. You're going to put more rear wing on the car. You're not worried about straight line speed, I can tell you. You're worried about downforce. You want aerodynamics, pushing the tyres into the road. That's what this is going to be about. And then in the cockpit, the driver can adjust his brake bias. Because remember, he's not going to have the brake pressure. So the fronts aren't going to be working as hard. He's going to need to have plenty of fuel in the car and try and balance his braking a little bit front to rear. Then he's going to have his cockpit adjustable anti-roll bar adjusters to solve Soften that off, and that'll be really important in the race in this session. If we get a bit of an emerging dry line, he can change that in the session. So there's a lot going on, but as I showed you in my story earlier, I still think it's about this. It's about risk management. This is the big prize, the big game. We all want to get in the shootout, but we want to preserve the car for Sunday. And with the sitting water around there, for all the things that drivers hate, sitting water is probably the worst of them because it's a one of the few things you have no control over. Laka, that's highly impressive, that description, but what is even more impressive is the fact you've been able to make it rain in the Hino hub screen. That is really cool. <laughs> that's my man, Malcolm. That's my man. Well done. And the only thing that I disagree with you on is it's not sitting water, it's standing water, isn't it? Well, that's the difference between you and me, mate. I'm always sitting, you're always standing. Quite a story of our lives. Thanks, Larko. Well done, mate. Great, Great description job. of all of the considerations preparing for what will be a heavy, wet session out there for practice number four for the Repco Supercars. Bathurst 1000. This is a round of the championship. We kind of forget that along the way. Uh, that's optimism right there on screen. Yes, I was <laughs> trying to actually get rid of some of that standing water. And the three minutes. things about this place, and you know it better than most, is it's not just the standing water, it's actually the rivers of water that run across the road. So in some areas of the racetrack, the, especially coming onto Conrod, on the way up out of the cutting, on the way down through the S's, because it's on a mountain, the amount of water that runs from the top down through some of the alleyways, some of the stormwater drainage, and some of the driveways. Because it's residential, the water runs out of the driveway and onto the road. The water runs everywhere at the moment, <laughs> every, every which way, as you can well see. I was going to make the point about this being a round of the championship. Uh, there are 13 rounds in this year's Repco Supercars Championship. This happens to be the 11th, but it, it tends to supersede the championship, the importance of this motor race. But Shane Van Gisbergen comes here with a margin of 525 points. He might be able to wrap it up this weekend in certain circumstances. He needs to leave here more than 600 points clear to be able to do that. Our next event is at the Gold Coast. We're looking forward to return to the Gold Coast on that wild street circuit and then wrapping it all up in fine style in Adelaide at the back end of the year. And we'll be talking enthusiastically about that over the weekend. Here are the rivers that Mark was talking about. And uh, these have been known to catch many a player over a long period of time because as you come out of Forest Elbow, you're building speed, changing gears, and there's still quite a bit of lateral load on the car through that kink as you accelerate and change gear. And if you just happen to catch in the power curve at the wrong time and it lights up, you can find yourself wearing a wall very quickly. And that's something that team principals, chief executives don't want to know about. One of them's listening in the background at the moment. Good friend Tim Edwards from Tickford Racing. The chief executive is on the line. Timothy, these are not good conditions. You need, and you've had a, one or two damaged cars this year. And you'll need straight ones at the end of this, my friend. <laughs> well, I like the fact that you call me good friend. So we're <laughs> off to a good start. Uh, yeah, I've had quite a lot of damage this year. I think we're, we're tracking around half a million dollars in accident damage, so you are 100% correct, Neil. I don't need any more. No, you do not need any more. Gee, it's been a wild weekend so far, Tim. We probably all expected it to be wetter yesterday and even earlier today, so at least you've got some data from the first three sessions that hopefully might be of some use. 
Yeah, 100%. You know, a couple of days ago, we thought we might get any dry running in. So it was a bonus to get a couple of sessions in yesterday and then obviously to get another one in this morning. So we're probably all better placed than we thought we were going to be. But uh, now the rain's here and uh, by our predictions, we've sort of got it for the next maybe 36 hours. So we're certainly all hopeful that we're going to have a dry afternoon on Sunday at least. Do you have a couple of ex-drivers in the commentary box? Do drivers make you nervous right now? <laughs> you always make me nervous. Forget about whether you're a driver or not. <laughs> what about right now? What are you, what's the instruction, the last-minute instruction of these guys driving out? Uh, look, I mean, these guys are smart. They know what they're doing. I mean, the it's reality is we've just got to get a feel for the car at the moment in these conditions. You know, we will have, we've, made, we've changed the setup slowly to a, to a wetter car. I think we've got a good handle on a dry car now. We were very happy with the car this morning. So, you know, now it's about, all right, just find a wet setup. But the reality is, you know, unless you think it's going to be a full wet day on Sunday, you'd be a brave man to run a setup like this. So, this is more about just um, understanding what we need to do potentially for a wet qualifying this afternoon, or probably almost certainly a wet qualifying this afternoon. Tim, thanks for taking time out of a busy schedule to have a chat to us. We appreciate you putting the headset on. Have a good run in practice four and for quality this afternoon. Chat later. No worries, my friend. <laughs> Good that's, comeback. That's 15 all. Well done. Tim Edwards on the line there from Tickford Racing. Uh, they did smarten that car up. So did. Cam Waters was quicker today and looked. the car looked more stable than it did yesterday. So they ended up being second fastest. So 0.19 of a second was the margin between the Davisons and Cam Waters and James Moffat. They're the driving combinations in the fastest two cars in that previous session earlier on today. I did a bit of a lap of the pit lane and and confirmed what my hunch was when you and I were finishing the last practice session. I said I mused on the fact that I had a feeling that maybe some of that track sealant was starting to diminish in its effect and disperse around the track, and it has, according to the senior drivers, and they feel as though they're not getting the same level of benefit. So... That was one of the reasons. I mean, typically, you'd expect by the time you get to another practice session, a fine practice session today, and you've learnt more about the car, that you'd probably speed up in that session. It didn't quite happen. They weren't far from it. So we're riding here in car number 97 with Shane Van Gisbergen, and championship leader, a former winner of this race. And you can hear in the background the wheel spin in the low gears, and he's treading very gently. And his recent World Rally Championship exploits will serve him well right now. Because <laughs> third in WRC2 last weekend Whoa. on the podium, and that was pretty cool, and ninth outright. And, uh, yeah, this is a different feeling, though. So in these cars, you know, it's a very different spring package. The, the, the stiffness in the car is massively different to that in the, the rally car. And with the thing that amazes me about the rally cars is they set them up from 100 metres out at high speed to be sideways. The last thing you want to do with one of these cars, you'll get bitten doing that. And the, you can hear in the background with the torque power, a torque and power and the delivery of power in these engines, nothing, 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 whack. And then when they do light up, it's a big burst of wheel spin. And what he'll be trying to do is drive with his right foot right up against that point where it bursts into wheel spin like that. But he's also wanting to excite the rear tyres at the same time, make a little bit of temperature. This is turn two replay, big understeer, and then as soon as the road cambers off to the left and he picks up a bit of throttle, it shoots sideways on him. These are the conditions when you see that mirror film on the racetrack where you've got to be ultra-respectful of Mount Panorama, and that's the engineering group and management team at the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team. Closest to camera is Martin Short. Andrew Edwards is the engineer for Shane Van Gisbergen, and in the background is the team manager, Mark Dutton. And actually, Garth Tander with a little beanie on hiding there in the background, probably hiding from everybody so that he can't be seen, so that they can't find him if it's his turn to get in. <laughs> That's probably right. So that line, I was just about to mention that the racing line clearly is a lot different in the dry, but what you're doing is driving an off-line and not using the crown of the road on the left-hand side up the hill out of turn two. You're driving it purposely off-line. Same thing coming out of the cutting. So what you find is a wet weather line is dramatically different where the grip level is and a lot of it's about the abrasion of the surface so we'll probably get Larko just to explain a little bit more about this but when you've got a smooth stone the bitumen where the racing line is goes shiny and smooth and gets filled with rubber that's perfect for dry weather running the problem is is the water sits on top of it 
as Dick Johnson looks on. The water sits on top of it when it's wet. So what you actually do is you drive it on a contrary line. You drive it off where the stones protrude more and the cars haven't been running as much. So the, the stones are more aggressive and therefore the grip level is higher. The contact patch is improved away from the normal racing line. As you are making your way from the host area back to the commentary box, Marcus, it's sometimes in these sessions with drivers, and, as you well know, from your own vast experience here, it's scissors, paper, rock as to who gets in the car. So uh, from the co-driver side of the losing equation there, James Moffat, Fabian Coulthard, Warren Love, Dylan O'Keefe and Cam Hill have all ended up as co-drivers in their cars right now in this session. And uh, look, the reality is if the predictions are accurate, this is something they'll have to deal with on Sunday. And so it's just as important to understand tyre behaviour, the right, getting the right tyre pressures, what it does to pad wear, brake pad wear, how the brakes behave, how much blanking that Mark Larkin was talking about before, can you withstand radiator blanking, all of those things, fuel burn, critical, because there are seven compulsory stops in this race on Sunday, it doesn't matter whether it rains or not, you've got to force those through. So it may be that under typical circumstances when you're at full tilt round here, and these are averages that we, Mark and I use, your fuel burns somewhere between about 4.6 to 5 litres of BP ultimate per lap. However, in these conditions where they're down in the 235s at the moment, they're 30 seconds away from where they were, that fuel burn will plunge down to three to three and a half litres a lap. Now, if you were to run all of your 88 kilos, 111 litres of fuel through your entire run, that doesn't neatly work out to be able to facilitate those stops. Yep. So you'll have to force the stops and you'll have to juggle them with your driver min-max, yep. 54 laps minimum, 107 laps maximum. It's dead set nightmare. Yeah. So you've got to work your compulsory stops, you've got to read the weather, you've got to process both your drivers and you've got to remain competitive. Good luck with that mission. <laughs> It's, we often talk about the high-speed chess game, but it's incredibly complex when you add the weather conditions that we're looking at now. What I said earlier in the weekend, and you and I have been talking about it all weekend, is these conditions bring a lot more players into the game. If it's, if it's dry and you're looking at outright pace, there's probably five or six red-hot favourites. As soon as you add water to this game, especially the amount of water we're seeing now, because it's not just a little bit wet, it's really wet. Then you add the Mudlarks, David Reynolds, Slade, Hazelwood, Lowndes. Will Brown, we know, is very good in the wet. We also know Heimgartner's great in the wet. So there's some real drivers who actually, they like these conditions. And in terms of number of winners, probably 12 or 15 when you start to look at that and examine the contenders in these conditions. I think the other factor that we probably to a degree underplay slightly in the description of this event is the random, yep. the random factor. Just being in the right place at the right time or conversely, the polar opposite of that, you launch into the middle of someone else's accident, junk on the road, all of those things. Visibility is going to be a huge issue. And you can see from Craig's car here at the moment, the super cheap entry, what a battle it is when you're tucked in behind the rear wing of another car. Now, Will Davison's the fastest at the moment from David Reynolds. This is going to chop and change massively depending on traffic. But we'll see the weirdest things occur here if this continues, where wipers suddenly fail. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, or you're going to have screens fog up. You're going to have all of those things. And so that's all part of the checklist program or oh, Tim Slade really wide. Now, whether that's intentional or not, sometimes in these conditions, as Roland Dane keeps an eye on Lowndes at the pit lane entry there at the opposite end of where they normally have been at Triple Eight, where the primary team's at the pit lane exit. Uh, one of the things that happens in these conditions is that you, you've got to make sure that you think about every conceivable stupid thing that can happen. You know, the, and because the graphics just describe honestly, it. it is, isn't it? You know, like, and really try and risk mitigate in that process. And really, history should be your guide. All you've got to do is actually pull out old races and look at the crazy stuff: doors opening, wipers failing, yeah, drivers yeah. not being able to get in and out properly. So it's fine and dandy to talk about being in search of a hundredth of a second, but sometimes you might need to go and search for quantum chunks of seconds on managing the dopey stuff. Yeah, exactly. And put yourselves in the driving seats now because, as I said about the mudlarks, 
Richie Stanaway has come up to third. So he's hardly done any laps. Van Gisbergen now goes up to second. Two. David Reynolds is going Two great. Will Brown is going great. Anton Di Pasquale is in sixth. I was going to make the point because I wasn't sure whether it was a mistake or intentional for Tim Slade when we were when Craig was playing cameraman for us. But I saw more shots of Tim, and he's actually hunting that alternative line that you spoke about before, trying to search for places where the surface has got a raspier finish and the tyre can hook into it, because he did it down the bottom of the circuit as well. So there's a bit of alternative thinking going on here where they're placing the race cars. The other guy worth a mention, and that was only a lap ago, James Moffat was fifth or sixth, so first of the co-drivers by a mile is Moffat. So he's operating basically as well as the, as the main drivers. Been driving the TCR car throughout this calendar year and has done some drive days and test days at Tickford. Slipped back into the business very easily again this weekend. He's pretty comfortable. That is the garage on the right-hand side, by the way, down there, that's being shared by Greg Murphy and Richie Stanaway together with Declan Fraser and Craig Lowndes, and they'll share a pit boom on the weekend as well. Will Davison's the quickest. And he's got only a tiny margin. It's 0 .0079 from Van Gisbergen. So they're in the 33s. I'll be curious to know, um, sort of looking in an engineering direction here, what the fuel burn might be in these conditions. Oscar Fioranotto takes care of all the propeller head stuff for us in the commentary box. So he's fired up his rotor yeah, on his cap. Get a bit of an idea you. because, and oh, and they've gone off in car number eight, and this is Heimgartner at the wheel at the moment. And here's Andres down in 18th position. The reason why I want to know those numbers is they'll start to become material in the race on the weekend, just get a bit of an idea as to what these fuel windows will look like when they're trundling around this place, because this is heavy wet. I went back and looked at what was going on in 2018 in a practice session, and then in 2017 we had a wet race, but this is as heavy as we've seen out there for a while. Come back to the question on that and get to Chad Nail on. Just hiding from the weather for a moment, guys, watching Brock Feeney do some laps from the Triple Eight garage and noticing who has and hasn't got race suits on. I can tell you that Jamie Winkup is standing here in his team gear, no race suit on at all. There's a question about who might be qualifying this car later today. I think that says everything you need to know. Jamie not even going to go out for this session. So I'd say it looks likely that we'll be seeing Brock in a qualifying session later today. They call that wisdom. <laughs> they call that management. Yeah. Uh, a, he runs the place now. Golden rule. <laughs> He's got the gold. He makes the rules. So uh, that's a smart play by Jamie, who's been a winner here on four occasions. The last one of those was 10 years ago, and it would be, it's no fun out there. Physic, uh, physically driving the race car, not difficult at all out there in these conditions. Mentally, it's torture, because you feel as though you're surfing a razor blade edge, and there you go. That's what happens when it goes sideways on you. Yeah, we'll get you back this will get out. If it can't get out, we'll trigger a flag. And where is he sitting? He's sitting third at the moment, Todd Hazelwood. This is up at turn two. He's gone straight ahead in the braking area up there. And it has now been red flagged. Red flag, pit exit closed. They closed the pit exit in that process. And uh, Will Davison was actually on a better lap then as well. So that's James Taylor on the right-hand side of screen. And the view of everybody up there in race control who are coordinating all of the marshals and all the rescue crews. That's a pretty good view of what's happened there at turn two. So that's Todd Hazelwood. I was searching for him on the timing screen. Mark pointed out that on the last lap, uh, which he just completed, Todd Hazelwood had moved up into third position. So good he job. was he'd set off on the next lap and it was three personal best sectors. And then he's buried it. Uh, deeply in the tyres, tried to get out. He's on the move next year, Mark. He's off to Cool Drive in the blue Mustang. Yes. And uh, Tim Slade's driving that car at the moment. We don't know what the story is there. Here's the replay. And he's run very wide. In fact, he's braked so late that he's ended up on the crest of the road down there on the crown and has fallen off the edge of the road and buried it pretty heavily into the tyres. There's going to be a bit of that going on this weekend. And this is what happened to Andre Heimgarten. We caught the back end of this in the RJ batteries. Brad Jones Racing entry. Podiums for Andre, a special one and an emotional one for him in New Zealand last time out at Pukekohe Raceway. And they jumped on the racetrack very quick yesterday with that car, so he was really happy with the way it rolled out. Ooh, whoa, a little nudge of the wall for Tim Slade. 
Now, he had a, more than a little nudge here last year at the beginning of the championship season, so that's actually hurt that left front. It's damaged the wishbones, and so he's creeping it back into the pit lane there at the moment. So all of a sudden, we've got some stories to tell here with damaged cars and problems, and no surprise given these conditions, Mark. So you can see the, actually, buckle wheel front and back. That shot was a great shot of the left-hand side of the car where it's buckled the front wheel, but it's also given the rear wheel a whack at the same time. So let's hope that the wheel took most of that force and it hasn't done too much geometry or suspension damage to the left-hand front. And put yourself in the driver's seat, folks, because as Neil said before, this is 30 seconds slower than a dry lap. So the grip level is so low but it's, it's not just the grip level being so low. Driving in the wet is, is relatively easy. The grip level is lower. The car sends you a telegram before it slides. It's not as hard to drive the car on the limit in the wet as it is in the dry, except for when the conditions are like they are now, when there's so much standing water, there's rivers of water going across the road. It's past just a, a misty rain. It's a, it's a severe storm leading into this session. And therefore, the amount of water is very, very difficult to negotiate. Got some of those fuel numbers that I was waffling about a few moments ago too. So with that 30 seconds a lap less lap speed out there at the moment, if you used five litres a lap as your benchmark, because they were hooking into some fuel yesterday when they were running quick out there, it comes back about 1.2 litres on average. Depends on the driver and the car, clearly. Uh, back to about 3.7, 3.8 litres per lap in the conditions that we're seeing there at the moment. So that makes a very big difference to the strategy equation on Sunday, which we'll get into that in the race on Sunday, should it be wet. The situation at the moment is we've got Van Gisbergen at the top of the table, but he's very wet. And it's Van Gisbergen by 0.7 of a second from Di Pasquale. It's going to change dramatically as the session unfolds and then sitting in third position, but unfortunately also in the wall is Todd Hazelwood. So this is the replay on board view of Tim Slade who just rattled into the concrete wall at the S's at the top of the hill. And we saw that there was massive damage on the front left corner of that car, suspension and wheel damage. And so it's got a full shimmy shake happening in the steering wheel. So you might need a wheel balance. I would or two. think so. Yeah, that left-hand front wheel was seriously buckled. And as a percentage, just working those numbers out that you were going through there, it's, it's roughly 15 to 20% per lap less fuel when it's like this. So that does play into all the things that you spoke of before about the strategy, because how long are you going to be in the car? We know that you can't drive any longer than three and a half hours in one stint. We know that the minimum requirement for the co-driver is 54 laps, but if you've got, say, two stints running in those lap times in the rain, you're going to drive for a long time. Well, if you work from a usable 110 litres in these cars, that's going to get you out to a 29 lap window. It's sort of almost getting back to the old days. Yeah. And you and I were sort of doing 30, 30 31, 32 yeah. laps on a fuel load. We had bigger fuel tanks at that point, I might point out. It wasn't because we were clever. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not us. So uh, that, that does have a, an impact. And then you start to think about 29 lap windows in 161 lap race, and then the driver minimums and maximums that we talked about, it certainly gets interesting. And it's going to be about trying to manage the complexity of that on the run, because what will happen is, and this is where you've got to be so <laughs> agile. <laughs> yeah, I should wear that T-shirt. That's great. Um, <laughs> what happens is you do your math. I was in scientific land there. <laughs> Those guys are in another universe. <laughs> um, you do your math. Problem is, everything changes soon thereafter. So you've got to be really careful. The, the, I think the key word in this whole process is agility. Yep. You have to be able to really think on your feet and read the conditions and be opportunistic in your play. And what will happen here, if it continues like this, is that somebody will get a, just pull a rabbit out of a hat and all of a sudden do something that no one sees coming, which is cool. Yeah. So we've got a red flag condition here on the racetrack. Todd Hazelwood in the truck assist entry has gone into the tyre barrier in the braking area up at turn two. Unfortunately, having just done his fastest lap, the good news is it's on the flatbed truck. Thankfully, in the modern era, that only happens when we've got a red flag situation. Back in the old days, those things were meandering around the racetrack when the boys were out there all having a 
ablaze. No thanks. No. Get down into where it's, I'm sure, balmy, warm and beautiful in the pit lane with Rihanna. It's absolutely stunning, Neil. <laughs> I've put the wet weather gear on with that beanie. Andre Heimgart, now you just jumped back in oh, out of the car for a quick reprieve. Tell us what, like, what the conditions are like out there. Yeah, it's pretty slippery. It's not actually terrible, believe it or not. The, the car doesn't feel it. So uh, apart from uh, going off through the gravel trap, <laughs> which I think is pretty obligatory uh, in practice here. But um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's obviously haven't driven here since I think 2019 was the last time we had a proper wet session. So it's just getting yourself I guess in, in tune for qualifying, but um, at the same time, you don't want to be hitting walls or doing anything stupid because um, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, just trying to work out pressures, work out a bit of the setup stuff, your lines, and then uh, ready to pull the trigger for qualifying later. So, what is the focus for this session, knowing that the weather's probably going to be set in for the rest of the afternoon? Um, I guess it's just trying to get the car working with the tyre pressure is very important in this. In this um, sort of conditions, the tyre pressure and tyre temperature are the main thing. And then also getting a car that you're comfortable to push to the edge and um, also, yeah, figuring out your lines and all that stuff. So it's a lot of things that have to come together and I think that's why we like to see wet, wet qualities because um, it mixes it up a lot and sometimes you see someone else pop up at the top. You've got the same attitude as what it says on your helmet, wet and forget and go racing. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Andre Heimgartner, quick Kiwi. He's driving for Brad Jones Racing and uh, has found a real happy home down there. He loves driving for that organisation and his results in the recent past have shown great strength. So he's sitting eighth in the championship now and he's had podiums in Western Australia at Winton and most recently, Mark, in New Zealand. Pet exit is open. Gives us a good view Thank looking you. to the ridge line on the east here. It's about 10 k's away from here and we've sort of had a strange easterly flow at Mount Panorama this weekend. We don't often see that. Most of the weather is usually from the west or southwest. Uh, the flags are still pretty limp out there at the moment. We've gone green once again on the timing monitors. Situation at present is that Shane Van Gisbergen's on top by three quarters of a second from Anton Di Pasquale. Todd Hazelwood's been rescued and they brought him back down reverse track direction from turn two to get on with the work on that car. Alex Davison's gone out in car number 17 uh, that he's sharing with his brother Will. And they're looking on the cool drive car at that damage in the front left corner, which is They'll be looking carefully at the hub, the upright, the top and bottom wishbones just to see how far that damage went. What we often describe as a light hit is anything but when you look at the car. We were a little dismissive sometimes because not us doing the work. Oh, you know, turn that around in a hurry. But actually getting everything right on these cars, getting it all to a line, isn't that easy? So that's a tonne and a half of race car meets three or four tonne of concrete block, concrete block wins by a long way. Now, one bloke that was brushing up against them yesterday, in fact, I think he might have even had a little gentle touch at one point, did an awesome job in the co-driver session in practice too. Garth Tander, good afternoon, sir. Oh, good afternoon, Neil. Neil, good afternoon, Neil, and good afternoon, Mark. <laughs> Until I haven't done TV for a couple of days. <laughs> That's right. You, you've lost your skills pretty quickly. <laughs> but you picked up your driving skills very well yesterday. You and I were in a text exchange last night. That was a two-minute 4.1 yesterday, Garth. You should be proud of that. That was a great job. Well done. Car was really nice. Um, the guys rolled it out of the truck really nicely. I was fortunate to get a couple of laps at the end of practice one, which sort of helped shake the rust off a little bit. And then there, yeah, managed to just get the foot to slip off the brake pedal at the right places a couple of times and uh, punched out a 4-1. So that's the fastest I've ever been around Bathurst in a supercar. It was really good fun. It's taken me four years to set a, get a set of green tyres in this car. <laughs> and when I got them, I was going to wait till. We picked you up, I think, at the dipper at the time. And as soon as we saw you, I knew you had the hustle going. And then we stayed with you and it was an awesome lap. Hey, how much of that sealant, that road sealant, played a part in yesterday's pace? And what were your thoughts on, on whether or not that was lingering into that session earlier today? Day. Oh, you can see straight away in practice one, the lap time for fastest in practice one was the second faster than the year prior. So you knew something was going on with the track. And when I went out right at the end of that session, you could see the black line straight away where the epoxy, and you remember back at Winton a few years ago when they did that and the same thing. And once that starts to spread around the racetrack, it, uh, it gets really, really grippy. So the grip was pretty inconsistent in the first session, like up through the cutting, it was sort of there, not there, there, not there, there. But then all the support categories spread the epoxy nicely for the end for the co-driver session because that was as gripped up as it's ever been. Hey Garth, I know that uh, when Shame was away on WRC duties, you had the car to yourself pretty much at Queensland Raceway. That would have been of great benefit leading into the weekend. Oh yeah, look, yes and no. Um, no, because he wasn't there, we weren't able to practice hot pit stops and all the rest of it. But for that test, I would have driven the car for two thirds of the day anyway, and Shane would have only driven it for one third. It's not like 
he'd be any faster doing extra laps at Queensland Raceway when we got here at Bathurst. So, yes, it was beneficial. I got a lot of laps. It's most laps I've ever done on a test day, 200 laps at Queensland Raceway. <laughs> so uh, they wore me out. They got their money's worth. But um, it was a good day. And for me, yeah, that was eight days prior to yesterday. So, you know, go back 12 months ago with all the COVID stuff. I didn't drive the car for three months prior to practice one here at Bathurst. So as far as preparation goes, it was great. These conditions are really trying out there at the moment, Garth. You've you won a race here in the year 2000, your very first one in trying conditions much like this. It's probably worth just delving into your thoughts and to convey to our viewers the knife edge that you must surf in order to be able to keep a 600 plus horsepower, ton and a half supercar on the road. Well, the real challenge here is it's literally called Mount Panorama. So the racetrack is on the side of a mountain. So when it rains, the amount that it's raining now is obviously you see all the water running down across the track. So you get a lot of these diagonal rivers that come across the track and they're not little rivers, they're quite deep. They're up to sort of 40, 50 mil deep. And when you try and get the car to go through it, you get a massive snap of oversteer. So when you've seen the cars leaving turn two, there's been big oversteers. When you drop down into the grate, it's a big, it's pretty sketchy. And then when you're down through um, the dipper and then coming out of Forest Elbow and then the little kink onto Conrod, when it's really pouring, like your fourth gear there and the car just snaps away from you so quickly and then breaking downhill into the chase. It's, uh, it's really hard work. So someone actually asked me, do you remember how you drove the car back in 2000? I thought, mate, that was 22 years ago. <laughs> I have got no idea how I drove the car, but I do remember it was very wet. So um, looks like we're gonna have a bit of rain for the next couple of days, but hopefully forecast is looking like it might be okay for the race. Well, you drove well enough to win it. So whatever <laughs> the answer to the question, it was enough to get the job done. The other thing that we're seeing out there, and you can add some spice to the conversation, a lot of people using alternative lines out there, they're hunting for grip. So just explain that to our viewers for us, please, Garth. Yeah, well, that's, they call it the go-kart line. And traditionally, you run off the, off the line in go-karts. You run out in the marbles. And when you do your track walk, you have a good look at the track and you understand where the, where the asphalt's effectively worn out. And we managed to do our track walk when the track was still dry. And you can see definitely shiny lines where the two tram tracks or the two tyres run on race line. And in the wet, that's not where you want to go because the asphalt's worn out. So you want to go where the stones are nice and sharp still and the tyre can bite into those stones. So you run around the outside. So we actually did a fair bit of research from when Richie Stanaway ran here in the wet a few years ago, and he was clearly the fastest. He was running quite wide at turn one, quite wide at the cutting, quite wide at Forest Elbow. So we did a lot of research coming here knowing the forecast was going to be quite wet, that uh, where to position the car and, and look at some alternate lines and try that. So that's certainly what Shane's doing right now. Thanks, GT, for your time. I'll let you get your race base back on and I'm check out what's going on. I'm not getting in the car. Don't worry, I'm not getting in the car. Well, no you're chance. smarter than that. I just, that's experience. Very clever. Well done. <laughs> yeah, no, they told me to put my suit on, but I'm not getting in. Yeah, I saw <laughs> you. Hey, you two, stay dry up there, OK? Yeah, yeah we will. You. I saw you hiding behind the data hub there with your little beanie on, and I thought, he's trying to stay out of everybody's eye line. We're on to you. <laughs> Thanks, boys. Get out of here. See ya. Garth Tander, he's driving the Red Bull and Bowl Racing car number 97 entry this weekend with Shane Van Gisbergen. It's a huge responsibility because he would love to have come here and driven the car with Shane having wrapped up the championship. So you've got to do a good job here, which is the demand of yourself no matter what. You've certainly got to do a good job for Shane. But there's a bit of added pressure to make sure that you don't bunker it or worse when you've got a championship on the line as well. Here's Stanaway. We're just talking about his pace. This is a very good lap. In fact, it puts him to second. He's only two tenths of a second away from Shane Van Gisberg. And how does this work with fast Kiwis? This young bloke who hasn't been in the cars now in the recent past, he drove so well to win the Sandown 500 in the rain with Cam Waters. That's the first time we all looked at him in the wet and went, wow. And now, right now, has hardly done any laps all weekend. He's arrived in car 51 as the wild card with Gregory Murphy and has come along and put it into P2 in this session. Now, I don't, we all know that it doesn't matter yet because it's not qualifying, but any time that you can come into this field and put yourself right behind Shane Van Gisbergen demonstrates real ability. His performance that weekend, 2017, sand down in very wet, murky conditions, both to gather pole uh, with Cam Waters and to win that race was really impressive and we've seen him do some extraordinary things. We've seen him have tough times in the game as well. So one of the things that Peter Addison and Boost Mobile wanted to do paired with Greg Murphy was get him back here, rebuild his confidence and re-establish him because he was an international racing driver of note. Yep. He had a serious international career going and had achieved a lot. You know, German Formula Masters champion, German Formula 3 champion. He was a winner in GP2 
in Monaco and Russia. He's done Le Mans, he's a factory Aston Martin driver. These are credentials that you don't just get out of a weedy packet. Absolutely. I mean, if you win in GP2 at street circuits, especially Monaco, against the very best kids from all around the world, that is very special. Yeah, so I'm very pleased, and I think the whole community in motor racing is to see him back in a car. Car number 22 is on screen, so we'll refocus the conversation now around Cam Hill, Coca-Cola entry. So Cameron is the reigning Porsche Career Cup champion, one of the seven rookies here this weekend, and what a baptism to be not only turning up here and sharing the ride with Chris Pither in the great race, but now having to deal with these conditions as well. But he's done a huge amount of motor racing successfully for a long period of time. These cars, though, are quite challenging to drive in the spectrum of wet tyres. Our tyre is a very hard one. Let's get to Mark Larkin for an update. Yeah, Compo, I want to show you this data now. This is remarkable to see the difference between dry and wet running. We've got Zane Goddard in Courtney's car at the moment, right? You can see here he is coming up the mountain here. This is his in-car. But this is his data. Like, wow. Up here we've got brake pressure. The white is his dry lap. Look at his brake pressure now. It's not even half as much. Touching the brake, tapping the brake everywhere. This is his speed. White is earlier. That's the dry lap. Purple is now much slower across the top. But this is the killer. Look at this throttle position. Green is now, white is dry. Look at this gingerly on the throttle. Whoop, off, on, off, on. This before was, look, up, bang, flat. That's 100% throttle. Look at that. A fraction of 100% throttle. And straight off it, same here. Fraction of it, and then off it. Goes to pick it up later, gets off it earlier. Here we go. Goes to pick it up. Look, much later than in the dry. Goes along. Look, nowhere off it. And why did he jump off it? Down here, this is his steering angle. Right? What he's doing here, look at the soaring of the yellow trace. This is where he jumped off the swaddle. Had a big whoop, whoop, jump off the swaddle. I mean, this is just outstanding. How cool is that? That is really that good. That shows like how that. hard it is. It's fantastic. Absolutely great technology. World first. Have a look at that. And like, you remember yourself when these laps were on like that, when you made it to full throttle, you wanted to give yourself an uppercut because you, you say, this, oh, why did I do that? Because all of a sudden I got this massive moment going. Mate, go back to the day. This would, this would be like, this green up be like one of Croppo's best in the dry. <laughs> Uh, actually, I had my microphone button off then for good reason. <laughs> One of the things that was, was really, really important in the wet weather uh, and showing that data trace really illustrated and reminded me of it, I used to look at the data and concentrate on not doing what I call throttle stitching. So seeing that line go up, down, up, down, up, down, try no matter how hard as you watch, look at the visibility up there, to progress it without having to come back out of it, to just drive against the traction limit, create your own traction control. James Courtney on screen here. And if you can do it without bursting into wheel spin and feel the back of the car and not have that up and down in the throttle, then the corresponding benefit was you weren't exciting the chassis and sliding the car and having to use the opposite lock. Whoa, big moment here. Uh, for Bryce Fullwood in the Midi's electrical entry at the bottom of the chase. It's a tough deal to find the limits in these conditions because the problem is it's a moving target. So it's not just a question of go out there and acclimatise because once you do find a rhythm in a race car, it tends to be, yep, that doesn't change too much. There's a little percentage variance. But I can see even out of the combox window here at the moment, it's got heavier wet outside. So the problem is... Two and a half minutes later, you arrive back on the spot, and the spot isn't what you experienced last time. Todd Hazel with your cars, just returned back to the garage. The boys were just saying it's just getting heavier and heavier out there. How difficult was it? And talk us through that incident. Yeah, it wasn't too bad, to be honest. I was pretty comfortable, but, um, yeah, just pitched the left front wheel and couldn't get it unlocked, and I was just basically, yeah, just waiting for the impact at that point. So, yeah, it was pretty... Pretty disappointing. Obviously, the you know, trucks this Commodore had some good pace there in the wet, and normally go pretty pretty good in the wet as well. So, but um, you know, hopefully we can get it prepared in time for the all important poly session coming up this afternoon because we show we've got the pace. What's that repair looking like? Do you think have you got confidence that you'll get back out there? Um, yeah, obviously, it mainly looks cosmetic, but I um, have to have a good look underneath now and see what if there's any other major damage. So hopefully we can stitch it up and get back out there. Appreciate it, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. He was doing a good job, and we said that he went to P3 just before going into the fence there. And what he was saying was, as soon as he locked the wheel, if you can't unlock the wheel, these cars haven't got ABS like your, ra your road car. So as soon as you've locked the wheel, then you can't stop it as efficiently, and then you certainly can't steer it. And that was the issue for Todd Hazelwood. 
on the end of Mountain Straight. Uh, now, whilst we were right talking here. to Todd, Richie Stanaway has gone to the top. So Stanaway from nowhere has gone to the top in front of Van Gisbergen. Just before that, there were three Kiwis that were the fastest three cars. Stanaway, Van Gisbergen, Heimgartner. Fortunately for David Reynolds, he now becomes the first Australian. He's gone to third. Cam Waters is in fifth. I don't know what happens in Kiwi motorsport, but they are certainly very, very good in the rain. Stanaway coming onto the straight there. You can hear just how that throttle modulation works. Okay, let's go for one more lap, one more lap, and then we'll come into the green. Just Leave listening to him now, so he's going to, actually, I think he's going to come in, but that's a superb performance. Any time to be the fastest in this group of drivers. These are the best operators in this part of the world. Brock Feeney, and now what, I think you're going to see one of the cars going off in the braking area straight away, yeah. So that is a big moment, and you spoke about it earlier. It's so easy to make the smallest mistake. And that's a river of water that's caught the Gusteckis out. But this is with Anton now. Was it Anton yeah. or Dalberto? I didn't yeah. see who was on. It was Anton. Was it? Yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon, it's Tony Dalberto. Yeah, you were... You... I c c couldn't work out who no, it was. No, neither could I. Yeah. It's Tony. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on out there at the moment. I, like. Looking out the comm box window, which is not an indicator of the entire track, but it's heavier here on pit straight at the moment. So I think people are getting trapped with that. But just echoing your thoughts on the performance of Richard Stanaway, that's outstanding for having been out of the cars for as long as he has. So a bit of a moment there for Galberto. Now another moment here. So there's trouble for Cam Hill. that spat the car all the way out to Murray's corner. So he's transited across the gravel down there as well. You're on, taking mate. some good. of the brake signage with him. Now, there's a, that's absolute, that'll be a river of water that's got them, go around, no go doubt. Around, please. Do another lap. So they've tried to come in. So we've just seen four cars off the road. There's the river. So just right there, he was out of control. He's totally out of control for 200 metres before finally he goes through the trap backwards, through the grass, and back out onto the start finish straight on the way out of Murray's corner. Have a look how fast that was. And, and I tell you, he was a little bit lucky that he didn't end up another car length further back because you fall into that gravel trap, you stay there. So the, my radio is now lit up with everybody being cautioned about pit in because of that river. So uh, conditions are diabolical out there at the moment at Mount Panorama. We've still got 30 odd minutes remaining. Richie Stanaway, quick. He's got 0.13. Oh, here we go. That's the fence. Gee, that's bad. So he got away ah, with that. That's Macaulay Jones on board. Flag, he red actually flag, had red flag. No, they've just red flagged it red because flag, of yeah. the location of this car. And he's got caught in that river that we saw all the Toyota 86s go off the road uh, earlier today. So as he's come through the right-hander of the kick in the chase, there's a lot of water running across the road there. And watch this. He's got his lights on. So he's actually out of control before he got to the right-hander. Lucky to get away with what is actually quite light contact in the end. Yeah. Yeah, so he was sideways at the kink in the chase. Watch the bonnet. Look at the air getting into the side of the bonnet here as well. Just getting in there and lifting it up as the car tracks sideways, which they're not designed to do. And he's got the brakes clamped, but he's totally a passenger in this situation. So one of the things about the wet is that your peak speeds don't change enormously. That's you still right. get there, you just don't spend as long at them. So that's given the front bumper a fair crunch. So they'll have to look at those bumper supports and the mounts there. And it's lobbed right underneath one of our cameras. Could there be a more appropriate sponsor for that car? Wet and forget. That is how sideways he had an arm full of opposite lock at probably 250k. Yeah, that's um, not a nice image to see. And we've seen a bunch of cars now really in strife out there with those rivers on the approach into the pit lane. And then it's very wet at the bottom of the chase. So it's going to take a moment to be able to clean this up. And Macaulay Jones just completely caught out by that one. 
best placing for him up here was in 2018. He finished seventh with Nick Perkat last year. He finished 12th. He loves the place and he typically does pretty well. He jumped onto the racetrack yesterday in the first practice session and was straight on the money. Look at the amount of rubbish that comes in with the cars when they go off the road like this. All the gravel, all the mud, all the water. And remembering that when these cars are presented in their garages on day one, they look like they should be at a motor show. They're absolutely beautiful. The garages are clinically clean. Spooky scenes at Mount Panorama. So we've got uh, the clock still running here at the moment, Mark. 30-odd minutes remaining in the session with Stanaway, Van Gisbergen and Reynolds. There won't be a gigantic appetite to be out there trying to find the limits at the moment with uh, those shiny streams of water running. And I can even see them out the window here in the com box, even on the pit straight. And this is the reason for the red flag. If you've only just joined us, Macaulay Jones and the Wet and Forget, Brad Jones Racing Entry, had a wild moment at the kink in the chase. And this is Cam Hill. That's a full-blown... If you needed a graphic explanation of aquaplaning, there it is. So the tyres sitting on the top of the road is not actually penetrating the water to get to and grab hold of the asphalt. It's sitting on a film of water and it just flew across the road down there. About this one. Wow. And Macca had it sideways. He didn't actually make the apex. And then he's transited the entire distance from the apex of the chase all the way into the gravel trap. There's the catch. And now, at this stage, he's in a pile of trouble. Didn't even get to the gear lever. Still in fifth gear. Look at it. And what he did is he, he actually had probably more opposite lock than he needed, which was good because he actually ended up driving the front of the car further left as we get further into this slide. So watch this. See the amount of lock he's got on there? And he put more lock on there. So when he did that, that's actually pointed the front of the car away from the fence, further down the road. So nice presence of mind. It, it, would, have, it would have gone in the fence earlier if he didn't have that much correction on it. Good job. A nice job in scary conditions. Brad is listening in the background underneath us in the Brad Jones Racing Garage. PJ, that was a spooky moment. Yeah, it was uh, certainly, I'm sure, got his attention like it got mine. <laughs> uh, looks as though you've got away with it without too much damage, though the bumper supports might have taken a tweak. And uh, these are really difficult conditions. Uh, you've been out there in these conditions when it's like this and it's mirror shiny. That race, for example, in 1992 uh, was incredibly wet. I can remember you in the HRT car here, Mr Jones. Yeah, I love these conditions, Neil. I just I looked at it today and thought, wow, I wish I was out there amongst this stuff. <laughs> Have you hit your head? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the trickiest place in the world in the wet, I reckon. Yeah. The only place I've ever driven at that I think is like this is Spa. And um, when, you, when you've got high speeds and you've got water, it's, uh, you know, for me, in a touring car, it's not a great mix. So, and Mac was pretty lucky. I mean, I thought he did a good job of trying to control the car, but really you're pretty much a passenger at that point in time. And and uh, lucky to get away with as little damage as it had. At the other end of the scale here, we've got Andre Heimgarten travelling pretty strongly. Brad, he's sitting fourth in this session at the moment. I spoke to him earlier and it was a good strong start yesterday. It looks like you've got good pace in that car and the good news is you've dropped it on the road and you haven't had to tweak it too much. And that's usually the sign of a, a good weekend, really. Um, this morning, though, wasn't so great. We, we struggled a bit with IFL and, and a bit of push when, uh, when some rubber went down. You know, the rain's going to take care of all that. But I, I feel like Andre and Woody are in a really good spot. And um, all the cars have generated um, a, a, a turn of speed at different points in the, the practice session. So I feel like the basic setup that we've got in the cars is, is not too bad. And looks like we're not going to get much of a run in the dry before we start to race. So it uh, could make for a really interesting Sunday. What did you do policy-wise with the team in terms of wet car versus dry car? Did you soften them off or did you change them very much? Not a lot. There's a, there's a little bit of stuff. I mean, you know, you also have qualifying car versus race car. So um, we've softened them off a little bit, but not, not gone too far. But obviously, we're searching for pace in the, in the wet. Tyre pressures are such a... Such a big thing. Here it comes. When not forget. Doesn't yeah, well, too I, bad. I was saying that before. Can you have a more appropriate sponsor? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should be maybe should be wet and panic. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Brad. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Bradley. I asked him yesterday about wet and forget, and it's a roofing treatment um, for yeah. uh, 
roofs on our houses. So, uh, yeah, certainly got the right conditions to be able to promote the product out there at the moment. It's wet and remember. Bit Exodus open. <laughs> exactly. Not forget, yeah. you remember that mackerel, remember a 300 kilometre an hour slide coming back down the hill here where he got completely sideways at the apex and that Zane Goddard in the foreground. And we've seen this in the past. Remember that wild moment from a few years ago when Mark Winterbottom Frosty lost it down there in greasy conditions and you always fret about the notion of a high-speed car out of control clobbering a car that's unsuspecting. And Ross on the camera here captured every frame of it to perfection and it drops right at his toenails. No damage done, well played. Nicely done, yeah. Big moment. And I thought the same as you. When Maka lost control there, I thought for sure he's going to get the car in front, which in the end, as the car escaped off to the right-hand side, avoided any collision with anybody else. And this is the thing that catches you at the top, because when you see these beautiful images of coming through Reed Park, you're accelerating the car in fourth gear, then you got the painted line. If you make the painted line, you make the painted kerb. If you make the painted kerb, you make the fence. So it's sort of this correlation of uh, grip reductions as you get closer and closer to the fence. Not what you want. No. Not in the script. Uh, we have gone green, by the way. I haven't really made a lot of noise about that. There are some cars out there, but what is interesting is that there hasn't been a mad rush. No. So there are more people in the garages at the moment than out on the racetrack. I can't imagine why. Car number 88 on screen. He's actually got Jamie Wincup in it. Chad was telling us before that he didn't think Jamie was going to pull the gear on, but he has. So he's gone out there for an exploratory just to see what he's dealing with. He's sharing with Brock Feeney this weekend, having retired from full-time driving at the end of last year. They finished fourth in the race last year in car number 88 with Jamie Wincup. Just missing out on that podium. There's a lot of talk on the radio. I'm sure you've been hearing it too about exploring differing tyre pressures now. So any of the cars that have gone out, pretty much every one of them said, check these pressures out, check these pressures out, because you really need to try to optimise and build the tyre pressure and temperature. It's the only way that that wet tyre works. As you said before, it's a very hard tyre. How's that big slide there that Wink Cup had? Exactly the same spot as young Macaulay Jones, and he gathered it up. Nicely done, Chad. It's funny how they made that change over in the 88 to put him back out there. It's actually come from Dutto himself. So Mark Dutton, team manager, was the one who turned around and said, Jamie, suit up. And Jamie was quite happy standing next to the heater. So he sort of half questioned it, but off he went to go and throw the suit on. So a big change, and it was a sort of on-the-fly change to get Jamie back out there. But I think the plan was that they still wanted to put Brock in that car for the qualifying session, even if it was just for Brock's own confidence to experience a wet quality here at Bathurst. I think if it's the right garage, Chad, I saw when I was up there earlier in the weekend, they've got a serious heater in there as well, they haven't do. they? They're yeah. the only ones that have got one. Right? Yeah. Sort of like when the cars come back in and it's been cold at the bend and sand down and they take the wheels off and you go stand next to the big brake rotors. It's sort of like that. So there you go. They're pretty popular this week just by having the... They smell like kerosene. I'm not I'm going to get to the bottom of what's fueling those things, but they're, they're awesome. Yeah. We, um, that might be where you find a huddle of commentators through yeah. the weekend, pit lane reporters in particular feels like that this weekend guys it's actually not too bad cold wise it's not the bend cold down here it's just trying to stay out of the water and everyone every pit everywhere i look mops squidgies just trying so hard to keep the water out of the pit lane and out of these garages at the moment it's a never-ending battle so you shouldn't have fit with the buttons on that thing chad it's showing an error on there at the moment you better <laughs> go and sort that out turn it off and on again yeah Whoa. have a look at the amount of water there now as you said because of the break so what actually happens is when the cars are all off the road, the water, the standing water is worse because there's not cars dispersing it. Yeah. So as soon as there's no cars out there, the, the conditions are way worse as we recommence practice four. There's 21, or just under 22 minutes remaining. And all it'll be, in terms of the team's policy now, it'll be how much, if we know that this afternoon is going to be wet for qualifying, do we continue to make it more into a wet car, continue to soften it off, stand the, stand the wheels up, reduce the camber, play with those tyre pressures, put maximum downforce on the car? And for the drivers, learning where that standing water is and where those rivers of water run across the road. Now, Scott Pye, you're in the garage, Pat's on, Tyler Everything is here as well. He's in the CVs. Marpa Caruso's on our TV desk. <laughs> Mark Winterbottom's kind of just walking around. What's happening in this garage? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty high risk out there at the moment, and, uh, you know, we need to do some testing before qualifying, but 
at the moment, you know, we saw the standing water, we saw Macca spin through the chase, and I just think it's not necessarily worth it. I mean, we've got Wing Cup going around at the moment in Brock's car. It's uh, either put the co-driver in and just give him some miles, or at the moment you just sit here and, uh, you know, we, we may go back out. I think there's a chance we will. But at the moment, it's uh, we'll just watch what the other guys are doing and see if it's worth it. And just your car at the moment, you're, you're down the order, but I'm guessing that's not representative of where you guys are. Yeah, no, I haven't actually done a time. So we had issues with the windscreen fogging. The fan wouldn't switch on. So uh, I haven't actually registered a time. So, yeah, we, uh, we I want to get back out because I hate just standing here seeing you at the bottom of the timesheet, but it doesn't matter until we qualify anyway. So uh, I want to go back out. I think we will in a, in a bit, but... Yeah, it's bad though, and it can go wrong pretty quickly. Considering how stressful it looks out there, it's pretty casual in here. <laughs> oh, yes and no. I mean, at the same time, we've got quality next, so I want to know what we got. I think we're pretty competitive, but, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, qualifying we'll find out. But I do want to get back out there. I want to drive as many laps as possible. Thanks, Scott. Yes, thank you. So we talk about mudlarks. This lap of Lowndes is going to be very good. Lowndes has always been exceptional in the wet. He's got beautiful car control exhibited that throughout the course of his career. Whenever the conditions are a bit mad, one of the guys that always pops to near the top is a Craig Lowndes. He's up 19 spots to fifth. That's another really good job. So think about Lowndes and think about Stenaway. They're guys that are not in these cars all the time. They're first and fifth. Well, Craig's just done a two minute 32. So Romy on the radio, but I, I would suggest that he's done a 32, and if you calibrate it against the track condition across the session, it's the I reckon relative to the earlier part of the session, he's done a better job. Yeah. Because people did 31s in what I think, I'm only guessing, I'm not out there, but it looks to me as though it's wetter now than it was earlier. So pound for pound, he's probably done a better job in worse conditions to end up being where he's sitting at the moment in oh, fifth. Have a that's, look at the water there. Yeah, so that's the replay that you commented on earlier of, of Jamie. And, I mean, it's a full-blown puddle. Watch this from the onboard. He, he didn't even actually advance the throttle much. Like, he, he barely cracked a percentage in the throttle before it lit up and was gone. Uh, we're just watching Will Davison. He couldn't get it stopped. Actually, it worked in favour in the end. It wouldn't have slowed him down very much. He might have found something. <laughs> He's missed the apex, driven right around the outside of the road, then missed the puddle. <laughs> Scott McLaughlin's watching in North Carolina, and he said, I don't think I've ever seen it that wet. And uh, it's a good place to be, not in the cars out there at the moment, I reckon. So you think about the numbers. The last time that we had numbers like this was 1995 warm-up for the great race. On the Sunday morning, you would have been in the race. Sunday morning, a 34 was the fastest lap. That's how wet it is. That was actually half a decent save to deal with what was going on down there at, at turn one. Will Davison did a nice job. Yeah, it was wet, I remember. Yeah, it was really wet. Horrible. Seen, seen some horrible days here. So, car number 56, the tradie entry off the road. Jake Kostecki has visited the sand a couple of times this weekend. Does he get away with this? He's right on the fringe. Cleaning the cars this afternoon, let alone making good fast race cars would be a mission in itself. Back to car go. number 97, Van Gisbergen. It's currently P2. He's 0.13 of a second behind. He tippy toes through the chase. Actually, let's just crank it up and listen because the throttle treatment's so key to this, you'll find it really fascinating how gentle he has to be.
someone's off. Yeah. Oh, that was Lowndes. So this is this is an exceptional lap. I, I would I could watch that all day. Yeah. That is unbelievable skill. He just put one second on his teammate Jamie Wincup. Uh, we didn't blink for the entire lap, having both done gadillion laps around here. It was really interesting to see how hard Shane was working to not upset the car. And there are a couple of really interesting takeouts for me in that whole process. This is what happened. Pit in, creating real headaches out there at the moment for car 888 and others. This is Craig Lowndes. When Craig Lowndes is dealing with it, I can see all the water coming up from Shane's viewpoint. I went, holy hell. So there's a massive amount of water. Here's another angle. Look at that. That is extraordinary. Just flew off the road. And this is the onboard view. You reckon the wife is going to do uh, a job red here? Flag, red flag, red flag. Red flag, exit closed. Oh, he was lucky to get away with that. Because you can't see where you're going and uh, they're reacting in the Red Bull garage at those images. But back to the Van Gisbergen lap. Personnel with an incident at turn six, car stop, drivers left. So race management channel advising, we've got a problem here with car number nine. So they've gone red flag, Will Brown, stranded an awkward position up there in the boost mobile entry shane's lap was intriguing for several reasons the throttle treatment is like we were describing before doing everything he can to progress yeah. to 100 percent without stitching that throttle trace turn two he drove around the gutter on the inside didn't do anything like driving it on the racing line it was interesting the way he tackled even conrad he didn't get to 100 percent throttle for a long, long, long time to try and avoid the aquaplaning. And he was about a second down on Jamie at that point. And then when he finished the lap, he ended up being a second up. So they're getting a bumper ready down there at the moment for Todd Hazelwood's car as a result of the damage done earlier at turn two. It was pretty heavy impact at the turn two wall. It was. And the other thing that was really interesting with Van Gisbergen is he, he plucked a fifth gear before the kink in the chase. So when he got down to the fast right-hander, this is now, this is the story of why that car's parked there. It's gone in the fence hard. That's the story for Will Brown. No wonder that car's parked against the fence at the top of the hill, because he has gone in before the tree section, before you get to Silman Park, and he's now gone around the left-hander. On board, have a listen. Slides it up and over the top of the rise. Goes to turn in, it's gone. See how that steering come out of his hand? That's actually made significant contact. So unfortunate circumstance there for young Will Brown. Watch this. Bang! And it probably isn't as hard as some of the ones that we've seen. We saw Greg Murphy have a really big accident there in 2014, I think. But for Will, sliding it in under there, the pace not quite as high as normal, obviously, given the grip level, but it just escaped. As soon as he turned the wheel, it escaped sideways on him. He wasn't able to gather it up. And as we saw from that onboard vision, serious contact with the left-hand side wall, just trying to get away there without getting too much mud and gunge on his racing boots, getting into the BP Ultimate medical car. It's gonna take a moment to retrieve that car as well, and that's had a big hit. That, yeah. So uh, that's gonna echo through the car, they'll have to have a long, hard look. That's the engineer, Tom Moore. In the background is Barry Ryan. And there's a team principal in there at Erebus, the Boost Mobile Racing. So they know they're now up for a little bit of work, unfortunately, on that one. So it's made heavy concrete impact. George Commons walking through in the background there as well. And so that'll be left front, left rear. And uh, meantime, work continues down there at Truck Assist Racing as they get sorted with the Todd Hazelwood car that made pretty serious impact with the turn two wall and tyre barrier. So we were salivating with that beautiful lap of Van Gisbergen's to be basically a second faster than the field. So that's as fast as you can go in those conditions. But what we didn't pick up on Compo was Jamie Winkup has done a really good job to be second. Remember, he's not in the car all the time. To be able to wheel out and do a lap like that. The other guy that we saw in the pit watching on when Zane Goddard was out there in the rain. James Courtney got on board car five and did a really nice job to be third. So there's some, we said earlier, there's some people that work their way into contention when the conditions are like it is right now. And Courtney and Winkup, certainly two of those, Lucker. 
Yeah, I was just watching that. It was interesting. I was standing with Tony Dalberto. I'll grab a chat with and Alex Davison. It was just interesting standing here with co-drivers today, watching the cars out there competing. We're talking about grip and water across the road and the skill required, like metre by metre out on this track. Tony, we're just saying, we're just talking about that. Yeah, just the difficulty. Uh, I've enjoyed standing with you guys and watching your main drivers out there. I, I, I just can't remember the challenges like they are out there on the track at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of flooding out there and obviously as we get more rain it gets worse and worse and then it sort of goes away. So the, the conditions change all the time. Um, I'm doing as much watching as what you are at the moment, trying to watch lines and gears and just dr little driver techniques and I'm trying to pick up on what other people are doing out there. Um, so then when we actually get out there in the race on Sunday, if it's wet, um, you know, we're, we're well equipped. But very slippery conditions. I had an off coming in the pit lane of all things, you know, just testing the uh, the in lane there and just off I went. So uh, there's no group out there um, if you do aquaplane. Unbelievable. Thanks for the heads up. I mean, it just I'm finding it quite remarkable. I want to try and grab a quick chat with... Uh... Hey, Alex. Sorry, mate. Give you a smack on the arse there. Can I just... You, Can mate. I just grab you for two seconds? We're just saying, mate, well, yeah. I, I really quite enjoyed standing with you two boys, watching others, watching the drama, and then you articulated to me just the difficulties. That eight or ten spots are in there, different lines. I've I'm, I'm, been doing this forever, mate, and I'm even amazed how tough it is out there. Yeah, since they resurfaced this track back in whatever it was, I think the first time we ran in the rain was 17. That's when I remember it. It was like an ice rink back then, and you have to do very odd lines. Like, you commented on everyone driving up the inside of turn two. Um, you know, it's the first day of driving school, you use all the road out of a corner. So to hug it, hug the inside there, up the middle, up the pitch straight. Um, there's all sorts of little tricks like that. Where, where Lowndes went off, tell me about that. Oh, in the pit lane, there's a river as well. So I was lucky TD had already gone off there and warned the, warned the guys who uh, gave me a warning. So I slowed right down and still aquaplaned and all the lock lights are on for a sec there. So it's tricky and uh, very inconsistent grip. Um, on different parts of the track, so as, as we were talking about, there's just like a there's a single line on a couple of spots that you got to commit to, and if you just get offline or just go that little bit too quick, the car disappears on you, like we saw with Will Brown. You know, he was probably an inch offline or something, and had a big accident. So yeah, it's tricky, risk to reward, just like you said, uh, especially from the co-drivers' point of view. We've got qualifying coming up, so uh, it's a fine line you got to manage. I can't think of a bigger risk versus reward game in premium sport. Thanks for heads up, mate. Enjoyed right. it. Jack Perkins, we were just chatting. That one, it doesn't look nice out there. And then unfortunately for Will Brown, that didn't look very nice for him, just from your point of view. Yeah, we've, we've been pumping him up most of the session because Richie in our wildcard car has been going really good. And Will just done his fastest lap. But he was having a, a good run there. Fifth fastest, Richie's fourth. So the team cars are going strong. And he just dropped the left rear on that painted white line. And it just caught him out under the tree. And... Unfortunately, just uh, hit the concrete wall. So, you know, our crew here at Erebus rebuilt that car in, in a record time. So uh, hopefully the, the guys and girls down here can um, get it going for qualifying. Yesterday when I chatted to you, you weren't 100% happy with the car for yourself. Have you had improvements with that for today? Yeah, the improvement is I'm not wearing my race suit at the moment. I don't have to drive in the wet. Um, but, uh, no, practice this morning went pretty good. I was pretty happy with the pace um, that I did uh, amongst the co-drivers. And Will got more and more comfortable through the session. And, and, like I said, then in the wet, he was trucking along real good. So hopefully we can get out there and get in the shootout. I think uh, all three Erebus cars will be looking pretty good if that's the case. Who makes that decision? Is that yourself or is that Barry or is it the team or Will? Or who, who says you can stay in the dry clothes? Um, I was pretty happy when the engineer said, when you're not required for practice for this morning. And that's when it was dry, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to keep the pants on this stage, but I dare say I'll be having a crack tomorrow when it's even wetter. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Cheers. Thank you. It's a key point in that conversation, Mark, is the gigantic rebuild that they went through with that car off the back of the incident at Pukekohe in New Race Zealand. Race control to all teams. Race control to all teams. Session is declared. It will not resume. By the time the truck gets back to pit lane, we will have no time remaining. So James Taylor just explaining to everybody on the race management channel what you heard in the background and uh, to his left driving standards advisor was Craig Baird and further to Craig's left is the chief executive officer of supercars Shane Howard was there as well so um, you can see the view from behind the gents there so James sitting in the middle he's got the view of all of the cameras around the track and you can see there are a whole range of people around the outside uh, we worked up there a couple of years ago Mark and a uh, huge number of people involved volunteers involved in executing safely this event so by the time that car is retrieved bring the 
vehicle safely back down the bottom and then release the field, they won't get a flying lap. So it's been declared under a red flag scenario and we rode with the lap that mattered for Shane Van Gisbergen. So that was cool to look over his shoulder. Home by one second over James Courtney. Uh, sorry, Jamie Wincup and then James Courtney, followed by Richie Stanaway and... Uh, then we've got Brown, De Pasquale, Reynolds, Heimgartner, Davison and Lowndes. And for Will Brown, unfortunately, that damage up the top is pretty substantial. And that's off the back of the gigantic damage that was done to that car and the huge rebuild that they went through to get it to a jig, get it sorted and get back in the shop and start from absolute scratch. So, yeah, that's going to be a tough one for them this afternoon. I suspect that there's going to be pretty serious damage done to the componentry. So you can see that there's very heavy wet conditions out there at the moment for everybody to try and deal with. And so our lap times have drifted off into the 30s. It's been a long time since we've seen that amount of wet weather out there. So these are the highlights of practice number four with thanks to Boost Mobile. Cars went out from the pit lane to greet a very shiny, wet and highly slippery racetrack. Dramatically different to the one that they dealt with earlier today and yesterday. So we've had three practice sessions to this point. First off the road down the bottom of the hill, Andre Heimgartner, then Tim Slade whacked the concrete up the top of the hill and that damaged the front left corner of that car. They did get it back out there. Turn two though was no good for Todd Hazelwood. Buried it deep in the barrier. There was a river running across the pit lane entry that trapped Tony Dips, uh, beg your pardon, Tony Delberto in Anton Di Pasquale's car, I'll get that right. And uh, Cam Hill with an ugly moment on the water down there as well. Unbelievable to be able to pop out the other side of that, not clobber a car and end up buried in the sand trap. Macaulay Jones, huge, huge moment for him. It actually jumped sideways right at the apex of the chase and then he had no control over the car. Slid hundreds of metres down there just below one of our camera points and into the gravel trap. This was Craig Lowndes getting absolutely smashed by the water down there and fell off. No grip available. That's Brock Feeney closest to camera. And the moment that triggered the red flag, Will Brown, bang, into the concrete wall, and that completely hammered the left side of that car. We were fortunate to ride over the left shoulder, though, of Shane Van Gisberg, and he ended up at the top of the tree at the end of it with a fine lap, put a one-second margin on Jamie Wincup. So Van Gisberg and Wincup, Courtney, one, two, and three. I spent a bit of time down here at Craig Lowndes Pits just watching the, the crew clean it up. I can notice that the entire grill has just been water blasted off this car. Craig, congratulations. You just did the first ever supercars water splash. That's a new record. Well, it's sort of like a difference to a wind tunnel. I just hit a water tunnel. It, it was literally this massive wall of water and I shut, I shut through straight through it. And then, of course, when I went through it, it was like, do you try to get back on track, go through the gravel trap or get run down the escape road? So I decided to go down the escape road. Thankfully, no one was on track. Did a UE and got going again. So I'm amazed it's not more dirty than what it is. And nothing got inside the car, no water, no dirt, no grass, just it's all in the engine bay. Yeah, it is, unfortunately, so the boys got some work to do. Uh, but look, the, it, it's one of those tricky conditions. It, there's some rivers running across in different parts of the racetrack, especially pit entry. Um, I think we, you guys, everyone's seen a number of cars run off. As soon as you get off the race uh, track, get into pit entry, there's just that little stream, and as soon as you hit that, it just aquaplanes. It just, it's almost like a, a cannon fires you straight forward. You reckon that'll be sort of like this for qualifying later today, and those laps will be valuable now? Uh, absolutely. I think that's why everyone went out and risked cars. Like, we saw some damage, but we had to do it because we know next session now is qualifying, and, and that's all important. Touch wood, if we get into, sun, like, Sunday-wise, it's a nice day, but at the moment, it's all about qualifying. Thanks, Craig. Cheers. James Courtney, you just said the best part of that was getting out of the car. <laughs> How did your session unfold? Yeah, it's not often you don't want to be inside the car, but, uh, yeah, the conditions are just wild out there, uh, to be honest, Rihanna. Out of turn one and up the hill, it's just there's about four rivers running across and the thing's aquaplaning. We're doing probably 270 into the chase and the wet and it's just aquaplaning. So, uh, so yeah, there's plenty going on. And, and um, as for trying to get a car set up in this, it's more... It's, it's more just who's willing to push a little bit harder, I guess. But, yeah, when we were sitting there and I saw that replay of Will going in, I said to Scalp, I said, look, Will's good and that's happening to him, so let's all be sensible here and park it up. And, yeah, thankfully we didn't go again. But, uh, but yeah, I feel sorry for all the fans. We've, uh, we haven't been able to come and put on a good display for these guys at Bathurst for a few years. And for them to be still here in the mud and wet, it's, uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Well said. Thanks, JC. Cheers, guys.
two blokes. Uh, hang on, there's a lot of noise here. Two blokes I've been really keen to have a chat with. Murph, I don't travel down this end very far, way down to the bottom here. Hey, There's two a, blokes. Did you, get, did you get a golf buggy? Two blokes I would absolutely come down. Big fan. It's so good to see you back here. First of all, Richie, magnificent lap. Um, so good for you to come back, be comfortable in the car in these conditions. We kind of half expected it, but, you know, tough out there. Yeah, it's great to have a, a better session than uh, the first few. Um, we went from all the way of the bottom of the timing screen all the way up to the top, so um, it was a bit of a weird one. But, um, yeah, I would have actually preferred to um, ha have some good speed in the dry, you know, just to see what this car's capable of. But looks like we might not, not get that. But, um, yeah, it was good just to get some laps in before, uh, before qualifying because it looks like we might be dealing with the same conditions. It's beautiful to watch. I often said he's a talented guy, you know, Spud. Now, after all these years in motorsport, it's taught you one thing, mate. He's in the race suit. <laughs> You're in your civvies, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm not silly. Exactly. I'm not silly. Although I think uh, I think I'm going to have to get some practice in it tomorrow, by the looks of it. But uh, yeah, it, it, that was awesome. I mean, great to challenging. How challenging was it out there? Uh, and great for him to to get some laps and, and find his duck feet, um, which we know he has. And uh, and great for you know getting some confidence in, under the belt. And um, yeah, it is going to be a challenging, very very tricky. Uh, wet qualifying where, again, the red flags, I think, are going to play a part. So, um, you know, trying to get a clear lap is going to be a real challenge. Anyway, I've got to say, a lot of people are very happy to see that car up there. Well done, boys. Thanks, Larko.